it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Well, my dear friends, it's late September, and those nights are drawing in. Autumn is almost upon us here in the Northern Hemisphere. And you know what? It's been way, way too long since I invited you all to join me around the campfire to listen and share some scary stories. So tonight seems like the night for just that. Well, my dear friends, get yourself a cup of hot cocoa, draw in a little bit closer, because here's the campfire. And I've got some stories to tell you and they go just like this. Mother is the name for God on the lips and hearts of children. Isn't that how the old saying goes? Growing up, it was certainly the case for me. Mother was my angel, my savior. Anytime I hear of the Virgin Mary, I have and always will picture Mother. She was my goddess, and I am her devout disciple. Anything Mother requested or needed of me, I obeyed without question or hesitation. Well, I feel it's the least I could have done, given how much she'd given just for me. By rights, my mother didn't have to give me nearly as much as she has. Hell, I wasn't technically hers. Whose child I was, well, I don't think I or anyone else could ever tell you. It was all so long ago, and I was very little. My first memory of mother and of my family is very hazy, being so young at the time. But I do still remember certain details, such as the emotions I experienced that night. I remember it was cold, bitter, and I was wailing, afraid and alone, aimlessly wandering about here in the middle of the woods, feebly trying to find my way back out. How and why I was in the woods in the first place are questions that, again, I don't know who will ever have an answer for. I just remember how I woke up one night as a toddler in the heart of the woods. I remember the very first glimpse I caught of Mother. Admittedly, I was, of course, terrified. I probably wouldn't have even known why at the time, but I guess even small children have some ingrained sense of danger about another living creature. She leered down at me, a predator to a wounded prey, with her small, ruby-red eyes. She was tall, almost a quarter to half the size of some of the taller trees in the encompassing woods, with long, gangly arms and hands that reached down even past her tall thighs. Her face, as well as her body, seemed to blend with the colour of the night, and so I couldn't see any defining features. I remember how I just stood there, quivering and looking up at her. I didn't know what to think. All I knew how to do at that age was wander alone in these dark, cold woods, crying and lost. I'll also never forget those first words she ever spoke to me. Why do you cry? Her voice was soft, soothing and tender, yet at the same time distorted. It seemed to have an echo in it. Though still frightened, I remember feeling some of the apprehension melt away at her voice. I'm... I'm scared. She cocked her head to the side, still gazing down at me with her burning eyes. Her head then twitched like the legs of a cricket, even making a similar noise to a cricket, as she raised one of her hands just enough to touch my face. Naturally, I flinched at her touch at first. When I felt how soft and smooth her fingers fell against my face, though, I slowly relented. Why are you afraid, little cop? I don't know where I am. I'm all alone and I'm hungry and cold. I want my mommy. As I started blubbering again, Mother's head snapped to the other side and twitched like before. She spoke again, continuing to lovingly stroke my cheek. Cry no more, little one. You aren't alone here and I won't let anything happen to you. She then moved her claw-like hand from my face up to the top of my head. Her eyes began to glow, and I felt a burning sensation that seemed to come from inside my head, forcing me to shut my eyes and shriek in pain. When I opened my eyes again, Mother was now kneeling down to meet my gaze, stroking my hair. I am so sorry. Come with me, little one. No more will you be mistreated. I'll take care of you. I just stood there quivering and with a frightened whelp, looking at her with tear-soaked eyes. Suddenly, from her shadow body, I saw four large, leathery-looking wings, like that of a bat, unraveling from around her torso. Come, don't be afraid. And that's when I felt her scoop me up and cradle me close to her chest. 
I tried to struggle, writhing like a fish gasping on a hook, but it was useless. I was held tightly in mother's embrace. As quickly as I could blink, we were airborne. While I beat and beat on her chest with all the might and vigor a three-year-old was capable of, pitifully crying and begging for her to put me down. Eventually I must have tired myself out and fallen asleep, thrashing and screaming the way I was, because the next thing I knew, Mother had descended in front of the mouth of a cave at the base of the mountain that overlooks the woods. Where am I? I squeaked, frantically throwing my head around to regain my bearings. Welcome home, my little cub, she warmly replied. I looked into the cave. It was shrouded in darkness, as Mother was herself, even somehow able to stand out from the rest of the pitch-black night, save for a single orange-looking speck deep within. She sat me down, and I just stood, frozen, or petrified, with legs that felt like gelatin. I felt her begin to nudge me forward toward the cave. Go on, don't be afraid. I slowly and stiffly trudged forward. I remember hearing loud cackling, more deranged than even that of a hyena, echoing out of the cave from within. Eventually I was swallowed by the darkness of the cave. I could hear the cackling grow closer and closer, some even approaching from my left and right. I'm home, my children, Mother announced from behind me. The cackling was now tight on top of me, and I wanted to turn around to run back out into the dark, foreboding woods. Mother's urging me forward would not permit this, however. And what have you fetched for supper tonight, Mother? The voice from directly in front of me questioned, sounding similar in tone and in cadence to Mother, although obviously a lot less comforting and much more vicious. Even Mother's urging couldn't push me forward any more now. Back away, she commanded. To the fire go, and we shall dine as a family. Sure enough, the deranged cackling grew distant, moving away from me and seeming to travel toward the orange glow at the other end of the cave. They're going to eat me. When I turned to run the other way, however, just as I'd feared, Mother deterred me from doing so. To the fire, little one, she cooed softly, continuing to nudge me forward. Eventually, she took me gently by my hand and led me toward the rather larger-looking fire compared to the more claustrophobic surroundings of the cave. When we finally reached the fire... I could hear the sounds of scurrying, like a multitude of creatures simultaneously converging toward the fire, the clicking of nails or talons being echoed all throughout the cave. I began to see more tiny, red, beady eyes, similar to Mother's, pierce the darkness in front of me the closer they came to the fire. There were pairs of eyes from right in front of me, as well as one on my left and right. I couldn't run or hide and I was now even in so much of a state of shock that I couldn't even cry in fear anymore. He's so small, whispered the voice coming from my left. Come, my little cubs, gather around. And at her command, they finally came into the light. Well, that's another thing I'll never forget about that night. The mix of confusion and sheer terror that flooded my entire body, freezing my blood solid. The first time I saw them, the ones I would, in time call my siblings. The one in front of me as well as the one on my left, both had bright pink skin that stretched over their bones and long gangly arms and equally slender legs. Wrapped around their pink emaciated bodies, they too had large dark wings. The one on my right was very much the same, except that I could tell this one was female because of its longer hair and breasts. The three of them squatted around the fire, looking me dead in the eyes, sizing me up. The one on my left slowly started to skulk toward me. I saw him open his mouth, splitting it unnaturally, or at least unnaturally to any human understanding, in four different directions, bearing rows of slender, jagged teeth, and distending wide enough that he probably would have had no problem devouring me whole. I could see him drooling, and his long, pointed tongue slowly unraveled from its grotesque maw, lapping out and weaving like it was a snake. Don't you touch him. Mother bellowed, her voice echoing so hard that I swear I could have felt the cave shaking. The creature halted dead in its tracks, looking up behind me to Mother. He started backing away to the fire again while I just sat there, trembling and weeping. I thought my heart was finally going to stop. Everything was spiralling in my head in a hysterical frenzy. 
What is this place? Why am I here? What are these things? Where's my home? My mummy and daddy? I felt a hand on my shoulder, instantly breaking me from my frightened trance, and I turned back and shrieked, stumbling back at what I saw. It was Mother, in all of her full detail, no longer shrouded in darkness. She looked just like the other three, tight pink skin, large brown wings wrapped around her waist, and a gaping maw that would stretch and split into four directions. I saw her head twitch to the side as she just stood there, observing me with her glowing red eyes as I shakily curled into a fetal position. She then squatted down to me, reaching out a large, gangly hand to stroke my cheek. Don't cry, little one. You're safe now. Her voice was smooth again, tender and loving. Even still, I just stayed huddled in terror. She crawled closer and sat down beside me in front of the fire. We're hungry, Mother. The one on the left eagerly snapped. I watched as Mother then crawled away from the fire, disappearing again into the darkness before re-emerging, now dragging the corpse of a fresh-killed deer in her right hand. I could hear the others titter with excitement. Patience, my children, Mother commanded tenderly. The first portion is for him, our newest little cub. The others then looked at me. He's so small, Mother, hissed the one to my right, the female of the litter. Where did you find him, Mother? The one on the other side of the fire in front of me asked. Mother didn't reply to either of them. She tore one of the legs clean away from the deer, handing it to me. Go on, little one, she cooed. You must eat. I stared back at Mother, unaware of what to do. I was confused and repulsed. I was hungry, but the idea of trying to eat a raw animal like that, at the time, sickened me out of any real appetite I might have had. Looking at the others around me, I could see their attention fixed on me, wondering, expecting me to take the deer leg and begin feasting on it like they wanted to. Slowly I reached up and took it with shaking hands. I could already smell the odor of death assaulting me as I took the leg. For another moment I hesitated. I really didn't want to do it at first. My stomach began to growl, however, when I could hear the others tittering grow more excited. Part of my young mind at the time must have panicked, afraid of what they'd do to me if I didn't eat the deer leg. I thought they might indeed make me their meal after all, regardless of mother's demands. So finally, I took a bite from it. Yet another part of that night that I can't forget. The very first moment I ever tasted the raw flesh of another creature, something that would become a very prevalent part of my lifestyle as I grew through the years and up to the present. The meat was tough, extremely so, to a point where I could barely even swallow a portion of it. I actually ended up choking on it, regurgitating most of it back up. I looked up to Mother, somewhat expecting her to be angry. But surprisingly, she just patted my head. Don't fret, my little cub. One day you'll be able to eat like us. That's when she used her long, clawed hands to begin tearing out bite-sized chunks of meat from the deer leg. She reached out again with the small meaty chunks in her palm. I, of course, didn't want to eat at first. The aching from my stomach from lack of food, however, caused my instincts to eclipse my reasoning and I, albeit hesitantly, scooped up a handful from Mother's palm and quickly stuffed them into my mouth. Well, it was unpleasant, to say the least. They felt so slimy going down my throat, and I did end up gagging again, but I had managed to keep them down this time. Mother patted my head softly before then splitting the rest of the deer to serve the other three. I then watched as they senselessly devoured the rest of the deer. That night ended with Mother huddling around me in front of the fire, cradling me to her chest. Rest well, my little cub, she softly whispered into my ear. I guess that's another thing about Mother. Somehow her voice, even back then, was always able to soothe me. Her voice always seemed to sound the way they say an angel's would, or rather, like what you'd expect a loving mother to sound like to a small child. Like I've said before, of any memory before that night, I am completely without. In all respects, my life essentially began then and there in those woods, with the family with Mother. For the first time in my life, I was given a name, the only one I've ever known. Cub. 
That was me, the little cub, the runt of the litter, not able to do much on my own in the wild. In fact, fear alone of just about everything that made noise or even moved in the outside world made acclimatizing to this newfound lifestyle very difficult. Naturally, this would tend to drive a clear wedge in between me and my siblings. Many times I remember how they tell me that one day they just leave me behind in the woods again so they go back to living as they had before Mother had found me. At least, that's what Little Brother would suggest occasionally. Big Brother, the bigger one with the foot-long curved talons on his hands, usually just whispered at night how he planned to help himself to my tender flesh when Mother wasn't around to stop him. Well, I guess I was fortunate then that Mother wouldn't ever let me out of her sight when I was little. Of course, that may have been another reason they disliked me so. Mother seemed to hold an even bigger fondness for me than the others. I never understood why, and I guess in some ways I still don't. But Mother has always kept me closer to her than the rest. Even as I grew into adolescence, Mother always handled me with the softest manners. In spite of this, I was even able to, over time, forge a bond with my siblings, or I did with sister and little brother anyway. Big Brother, I suppose, couldn't forgive that I seemed to have stolen Mother's affections from him. I guess, though, it was because of him that I would learn one significant thing. What it was like, and how it felt to kill another living being for the first time. By this time, I was much older and bigger. I'd grown to stand at least five feet tall, able to meet eye level with Little Brother, and at least chest level with Big Brother. It was at this time that Mother would let the others take me out into the woods to hunt for food with them, without being present herself. I was frightened at first, never before having learned how to hunt, much less kill another animal. But by now the winter was approaching and Mother had always grown weaker with the colder weather. That meant that we, the cubs, had to venture out to gather food. Before, though, being so small and defenceless, I had always stayed in the cave with Mother while the others went out but now I felt that the time was right for me to join them in gathering food for her. Mother was reluctant, and I could see Big Brother wasn't fond of the idea either. In the end, however, Mother ruled in my favour, and I was to accompany Big Brother into the woods. Trying as hard as I could, I just wasn't able to keep up with him, and of course he had no qualms with essentially abandoning me the first chance they could. And so there I was, deep in the heart of the woods again, alone defenseless and scared. But this time, I knew I couldn't simply just hope that I'd be rescued by Mother or anything else. No, I'd have to finally learn how to fend for myself. For a while, I just stood there listening, trying to get a bearing on my surroundings. That was how I learned to focus my hearing and learn the different sounds of the world around me. The sounds of the wind bristling through the trees, the distinct sounds of the different critters around me in the woods. I learned which ones chirped and which ones would howl or squeak, which ones were fast when scurrying about and which ones would take their time. Finally, I heard it. I heard the sound of heavy footsteps approaching. They were approaching quickly despite how heavy they sounded. Whatever it was was moving on two feet rather than four, unlike the deer that usually passed through these woods. Another thing that was different was the sounds it was making. It was a familiar sound. Too familiar. Hey, Orville, take a gander over here. I heard this coming from my right, and I quickly dove behind a nearby tree. Still concentrating, I could hear the heavy footsteps coming toward the spot I was standing in only a moment ago, now joined by another set of footsteps equally as heavy. I heard them again. What is it, Sol? What are you going on about now? You telling me you didn't see that rushing off there? See what? I don't really know, but I'm almost willing to bet I saw a boy dart off into the trees there. Where? I could hear them come closer and closer, until I could hear them stop right where I was standing before. Or right there. I heard one of them bark a laugh before saying, Sal, sometimes you make me wonder about all them trips to the bar you've been making lately. Oh, damn it to hell, Rick. I know what I saw. There was a boy standing right here. Soon, though, I began to feel a breeze blast all across my right side, followed by a distant flapping sound. 
Oh, I knew that, Sal. Big Brother? You hear that, Sal? I heard the first one say again. Oh, what now? Shh, listen, I heard him say. You hear that? A moment passed and I could hear the flapping get closer, starting to fade with each inch it gained as if trying to silently now zero in on our location. That was when a head-splitting screech was heard and I saw Big Brother dart down from the sky, tackling and pinning one of them down. I could see him struggling underneath Big Brother, but to no purpose. Big Brother began tearing and biting at the throat of his prey, and that's when I heard a loud bang, followed by Big Brother screeching in pain. I saw him clutching his arm, and I could see a black stream running down his right wing. I heard it again, and again Big Brother cried out in pain. Oh, they're going to kill him! And that's when I bounded out from behind the tree and grabbed onto the one that Big Brother had attacked. Immediately I bit into his throat and started gouging his eyes, just as I'd seen Big Brother do. I could feel him trying to pry me off, but he must have been weakened by either mine or Big Brother's assault. It wasn't long before I felt him cease struggling and go limp. I heard another bang before a searing pain surged through my right arm. I looked up to see the other one, holding his weapon in my direction. For a second I just stared, frozen in fear, expecting for him to use it again to finish me. But that was when something strange happened. This thing, this monster, then lowered his weapon, and I watched his eyes widen as if in shock. No, no, it can be, he mumbled. Oh, his guard is down, I thought. Now's my chance. I slowly crawled toward him. He stood motionless. Mouth agape. Ben, he finally said. Benny, is that you? I kept crawling toward him, paying no attention to his words. I wasn't going to be swayed from my objective. I'd kill him for what he'd done to Big Brother. He then slung his weapon over his shoulder and said, Oh my God, Benny, sweet Jesus, Mary and Joseph, my little Benny, it's really you. He sounded elated, like he'd just realized some great truth. I stopped when I saw him start toward me. I lowered myself to the ground, poised to pounce as soon as he was close enough. Oh, I'd go for the throat, just as I'd done with the other one, and I wouldn't stop there. No, I'd rip and tear him inside out. Oh, my boy, I thought I'd lost you. And that's when I sprang for the kill. In an instant, my teeth were sunk into his flesh, and I could taste his blood flowing into my mouth. Oh, it was exhilarating. He frantically tried prying me off of him, but it was useless. I had him, and he wasn't getting away. I was doing it. I was finally killing my own prey, just like the family. Just like Mother. His flailing became weaker and weaker. I released my jaws from his throat and stood over him, triumphant watching as his body convulsed until finally relaxing. As the life left his eyes, he opened his mouth and made a series of gurgled, croaking noises. I noticed, though, that he seemed to be trying to speak. Benny, I heard him choke out. I'm so sorry, son. And with this, his eyes closed and he was lifeless. I stood frozen. Adrenaline was still surging through me. I did it. I did it. I killed my first prey. My heart was racing and I began beating my chest, howling to the sky. I was grown now. I was now a hunter. I was no longer just the little cub. I was an alpha. Then I looked at the face. I wasn't sure why, but something struck me about his face. Something was almost... almost familiar with it. It looked a lot like me. I knelt down and observed him more closely. His jaw was pointed, his face gaunt. I felt my own face to find that my face matched these features. What is this? I wondered. I ran over to the nearby stream and looked into the river. And that's when adrenaline left me. I was horrified with what I saw. It was him. 
I saw the younger face of my prey staring up at me from the lake. I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. it had to be some trick. Why did this man look like me, or I look like him? What was he? Well, he was a monster. He'd hurt Big Brother, my family. So why did I have the same face as him? I ruffled the water and began clawing at my face. This isn't real. This isn't real. I'm not him. I'm nothing like him. Deep down, down in the deepest part of my heart, though, I knew the truth. His dying whispers started repeating in my head. I'm sorry, son. Overcome with rage, I started howling at the sky while pounding the ground with my fists. I took up nearby stones and hurled them in every direction, not caring what they'd hit. I was lost, mentally and emotionally, and I had no control over my behaviours. Eventually I collapsed to the ground, exhausted. I was weak and tired. Just as I was losing consciousness, I heard, in the distance, the sound of large flapping wings. From above I could see the silhouette of Mother as she descended. I finally fell unconscious when I felt Mother lift me from the ground, cradling me just as she'd done all those years ago when I was still so small, weak and fragile. It was night when I awoke again. Sister and little brother were huddled around the fire, mother in the middle of her back facing me. My body still felt so exhausted and I was slow to move again. Mother, I murmured softly. I saw sister and little brother snap to look at me. Mother didn't move. I weakly began crawling my way over to them. Approaching the fire, I noticed that the faces of the other two were downcast and somber. They looked at me and sister asked, what happened? Reaching the fire, I felt my heart fall from my chest. It was Big Brother. He lay in front of Mother, motionless. I scurried over and began shaking him, crying out, Big Brother! Big Brother, wake up! I felt Mother's hand rest on my shoulder, pulling me away. I stayed firm, though, feebly shaking the body of Big Brother until she forcefully pulled me away from him. He's gone, little one. I crumpled on the floor of the cave and began crying. Every bit of the vigor, the confidence, the triumph I'd earlier felt had now all but abandoned me. I was now just the crying whelp I was all that time ago when Mother had found me. Big Brother was dead, and it was all my fault. I was weak, like I'd always been. If I was strong like my family was, I could have saved him. But I wasn't like them. I was like the ones that had killed him. It's all my fault. I bawled, looking at Mother. She was silent, continuing to stare at the fire. I just laid there, crying. I didn't know what else to do. I wanted Mother to say something, anything. I wanted her to either absolve me or condemn me. To either show me love or her wrath. Instead, she did none of that. She just sat, silent. In some way, I knew what this meant. She hated me. I was responsible for the death of her firstborn, and she would never forgive me. I cried until eventually falling asleep again. It wasn't long before I was awakened again by the sounds of shuffling coming toward me. I slowly stirred awake to find sister and little brother crawling low to the ground, the way I saw them do when they were set to pounce. Sister, little brother, what's going on? He's awake, sister whispered. Little brother then bounded toward me, his talons outstretched, ready to tear me apart. With quicker reflexes than I ever thought possible, I rolled out of the way and stood up. Sister spread her wings and attempted to glide toward me, catching my face and knocking me over with a vicious swipe of her talons. She circled around and landed, leering over me. What are you doing? What big brother would have wanted us to do? It's because of you, Cub, that he's dead, little brother hissed before pouncing on top of me. He immediately started slashing at me, opening wide gashes in my chest. I shrieked with pain as he sent one of his claws across my eye. I was able to hurl him off me and send him crashing into the wall of the cave. I was about to try and run, but sister was too quick, and in seconds she had me pinned down again. She sent a hard stomp onto my shoulder, immediately breaking it. 
She did the same to my other arm, proclaiming, We should have listened to Big Brother. We should have eaten you when Mother first brought you here. With my one good eye, I watched Sister raise up and unhinge her jaws when, all of a sudden, she was swept off from the top of me by something huge. Looking up, I saw that it was Mother. She had Sister and Little Brother held down to the wall of the cave. I used the opportunity to run, bolting straight to the mouth of the cave. I ran and ran, not at all knowing where I was going or even where I wanted to go. At some point, I twisted my ankle and fell. My lungs were starved of air and I was aching all over. My body felt broken, both from the injuries of the struggle as well as from sheer exhaustion. Because of this, I couldn't move. I just laid on my back, staring up at the night sky and the trees above me. I remember how cold it was, and I began to wonder if that would be it for me. But I was going to freeze to death there on the forest floor, alone. Weak. Without anyone. Without mother. As exhausted as I was, I wouldn't be able to fall asleep. I stared at the sky all night and into the next dawn. I picked myself up again when the sun was finally high enough for its light to break the top of the tree line. Not knowing where to go, I began wandering through the woods. This went on for hours. How many I couldn't tell you, and I can't tell you what time of day it was either when I finally stopped. What I can tell you is that it was when I heard sounds familiar to the ones that I'd heard the previous day that I quickly dove for a nearby tree. Looking out, there were four of them. Tall, broad-shouldered figures that were covered in blue and spoke into their shoulders. Two of them I saw had what appeared to be dogs, like those Big Brother and the others would occasionally bring to the cave for supper. These, however, were much bigger and looked far more vicious. I started to panic when I saw one of them turn and begin to bark in my direction, alerting the others. I watched them move closer to me, and I stood frozen, not knowing whether to run or to try and fight. In the end, I was forced to act when the barking dog bounded to the tree and pounced on me. I tried to run, but I was no match for its speed. Upon catching up to me, I cried out in pain when I felt its teeth sink into my leg, causing me to fall face first to the ground. For a moment I struggled with the dog, trying to hold its jaws away from my face, when I suddenly heard that all too familiar flapping of wings. From ahead I heard one of the figures in blue cry out, What the hell? I watched his mother dove down, snatching the dog off of me before sending it hurling toward the figures. The other one attempted to leap at Mother to attack, only to be batted away like his companion. That was when one of the figures pointed a weapon similar to the one that had killed Big Brother, but this one appeared smaller. Boom, boom, boom. They were deafening, and I had to cover my ears. When I looked at Mother, she was unharmed and was gliding through the air, swiping her attacker off the ground by his throat. I heard two more deafening bursts, and I watched Mother drop her prey and fall to the ground. Mother! I screamed, running over to her. Before I could make it all the way to her, though, I felt large, rough hands seize my arms. My struggle was pitiful. Their grip was strong, like the dog's jaws. I felt them forcing me away while I flailed against them. Let me go! Mother wasn't moving. I could see a dark, black pool forming around her. Mother, let me go. Mother! They paid no attention, and I was finally silenced when I felt something strike me in the face. Instantly, everything went dark. I remember dreaming. I was back in the cave, the fire lit and gathered around me. Mother was there, and the others. They were looking at me, concentrating their judgment on me. You've grown, little carp, Mother says. You've grown and you've learned. Learned how to kill. I'm proud of you, little one. You're strong, even if you don't see it yet. But how? I cry out. How am I strong? I couldn't save you. You're dead and it's all my fault. I'm just like them. You are nothing like them. You, little cub, of strength you don't know of. You showed this when you killed the one that hurt Big Brother. You chose to avenge your family, and you'll do it again. What do you mean? You'll learn how to hunt. You'll become an apex predator. Become the hunter I raised you to be like your siblings. And that was where the dream ended. 
I woke up again in a dark grey room, similar to the cave. This, however, wasn't lit by a fire. Instead, long, bright white lights lit the area around me. In front of me was a table with a dark window behind it and a large door to the left of it. Suddenly the door opened and one of the figures entered, covered in white and wearing something reflective over his eyes. I wanted to leap forward to attack, but I found myself to be strapped to where I was. Oh, easy there, I heard him say. I'm not here to hurt you. My name's Dr. Carter, and I'd like to help you. I was silent. He laid some papers down on the table in front of me. Can you tell me your name? I just sat, glaring at him, wanting only to rip him apart. He looked friendly, warm, and welcoming. Oh, I wasn't fooled, though. I wasn't fooled by this or by his claim to want to help me. How could he want to help me? He's one of them. He's with the ones that killed Mother and Big Brother. Can you uh, tell me your name? He repeated. Cub. I spat harshly, my voice dripping with venom. I'm Mother's little cub. Mm, I see. What's the name you were born with? I am Mother's little cub, I repeated. He tried to ask me again what my real name was, to which I continued to give the same answer. He tried to ask me questions about mother and the family. I didn't answer. I felt he deserved no answer. He's one of them. He's a man. I'm not. I'm mother's little cub. It's these words that I've held on to now. These are the words I've lived by now for the past few years that I've spent in this place, this prison, far from the cave from where I'd always called home. It's these words that have kept me strong, and it's her words, that I'm not of them, that I am and will always be her little cub. Yeah, those keep me from falling for the lies they try to feed me, such as that my name was Benjamin, that I was abandoned by my real mother long ago, and that mother wasn't real. No, oh, they're liars. They're men. I'm not. I'm mother's little cub. And it was there that I would continue to grow into an adult. As I grew, I would learn more and more of their ways, the ways of men. They taught me to read, to write, and how to communicate the way they do. Furthermore, the more I grew up, the more I would grow to detest myself when I looked into a mirror, seeing the all-too-haunting image of Big Brother's killer facing me, the one who called me son. Yeah, he was one of them. He was a man. Well, I'm not. I am Mother's little cub. At night, I still see her. She tells me how proud of me she is, how much of a predator I've become. You've learned their ways, little cub, she tells me. You've earned their trust. Now use it against them. Use their knowledge against them the way we use the knowledge of the forest animals to hunt. I'm proud of you, little cub. I was always proud of you. Now, make me proud again. These were the words that drove me when I finally escaped. I remember everything, the way I ever so quietly left the room they confined me to and skulked down the dark halls. I remember how peaceful he, this man, Dr. Carter, looked as he sat at his desk, not suspecting in the least of my presence behind him. I remember how exhilarating it was as I crept closer to him, lowering myself to the ground, ready to strike. Oh, I was in the woods again. I was hunting just like my family did. I was the alpha predator, and he was my prey. I remember the way his eyes looked when I sprang upon him, sinking my teeth into his throat. He was frozen with fright. I remember the ecstasy I felt when life left his eyes, the same as when I watched life leave the eyes of the man in the woods. Through it all, no attention was alerted to anyone else. He died silently, agonizingly gasping for breath. After this, I was able to slip just as quietly through the main hall to find my way out, back into the outside world. From there, I spent many days and nights roaming until I finally found the woods again, where I remain now. I write this as a warning to you all, after having claimed another prey only last night. There were two young boys that decided to enter these woods with their guns, just like the men that took mother and my family from me. Well, I may look like you, sound like you, and have learned your ways, but I am not one of you. I'm something more. 
I am an alpha, an apex predator, and I am, always was, and always will be, mother's little cub. And even in her death, I'll do anything for mother. My eyes are in a fervorous affair with the clock, and my focus is none the wiser. The police dispatcher is pleading for me to humour her inquiries, if for no reason other than to keep my consciousness afloat. It is so late, and today has been so challenging. Nevertheless, I'll gratify her with my story, because I'm really in no mood to tell it again later. Mariam Cliffington happened into our photo centre again today. These visits are becoming relentless, as are the innumerable poorly photoshopped images on her SanDisk flash drive. Every day it's the same process. She perches at our photo kiosk, orders small batches of 5x7 and 4x6 photos and crones over the photo printer as it squeals its mechanical protests. The unfortunate photo specialist on duty is then scolded by dear old Mariam as the colour in my son's face is coming out too pale and my granddaughter's dress looks smudged too washed out becomes as recitable as the Lord's Prayer. The project is then gifted to me as I am the only one who receives her limited mercy. This is due in part because I am the only one in the store qualified as a professional photo editor. I also look just like her son. At least, that's what she tells me every time she swoons over the photos I correct. I personally never saw the extreme resemblance. We have similar Hollywood-esque hairstyles, dark stubble, light eyes and a fair complexion, but that's where the similarities end. Well, that's my general assumption. Truthfully, I have never met him. According to Mariam, they don't get along so well these days. Reportedly, her son has become what she calls a changed person after he split with his wife. That always seemed odd to me, because nearly every day I am draining the red out of a new family photo that she zealously adds in her novice photoshop sessions. It seems the family often stays in touch. Today we discuss more personal topics, such as my college degree and her family get-togethers. She told me she was celebrating her granddaughter Gracie's fifth birthday today and was putting together a photo album and baked goodies to send her. Today's photos were of the girl from her previous birthday. She had straw blonde hair, her father's bright blue eyes, rosy red cheeks and a devilish grin that strongly reminded me of the girl from the movie Problem Child 2. When the topic turned to me being a graduate in multimedia design, she immediately began to give me the shakedown on my talents as a web developer. She wanted me to build a forum-based website just for her family. She wasn't fond of the public limelight social media granted, but wanted regular updates from her son, granddaughter, their prized show horses, and images from all the reunions they've had over the years. I'm not a fan of Mary. She may treat me in a more humane manner than my colleagues, but she's always so bitter. She carries an air of importance about her that mismatches with who she is. <laughs> like a pug in a sweater made of silk. The last thing I want from a client is a beady pair of eyes reflected behind ancient, dark-rimmed tortoiseshell glasses, critiquing my every line of code with ignorant words laced with the smell of stale coffee and menthol cigarettes. Her grey-black hair is often wild and tangled, as if she was fleeing her home every morning to develop photos which contain the cure for cancer. Despite her lack of self-management, she saw herself as an expert in managing the talents of others. 
I inquired about the specifics of her family problems, but I assumed this attitude must cause the bulk of it. The sense of entitlement is something I don't blend well with. After endless barrages of questions about my rates, schedule and ability to tutor her in Photoshop, I gave her my business card and told her to call me in a few weeks. Truthfully, I am in my two-week leave period and on my way to a better job, and this was a simple method to evade her until I would never have to see her again. She seemed content with my proposal and took my card. I told her to forward my congratulations to her granddaughter on a five-year milestone. As she shuffled out of our store, I looked again at the refuse pile of discoloured prints. If her family is so dysfunctional, why does she bring in new pictures of her son and granddaughter every other day? Why is a spitting image of the son she frequently quarrels with? Am I so reasonably treated by her? Those suspicions came to fruition a few hours later when a twenty-something couple dropped off a few rolls of 35mm film. They had matching black hair, the athletic builds of bicyclists, and eyes that reflected deep kindness, but an even deeper sense of fatigue. The lab's business was running slow today, so I was immediately able to process their order and begin development. The development process is always the same. I feed just enough of the raw film through a machine to attach it to a leader card, which is mechanically guided through the film processor. After it completes its voyage and the developed film is fed through, I place it on the scanner of our printing machine and check the frames digitally for color flaws and inconsistencies. The picture showed the young couple celebrating another birthday. A boisterous banner which read, Happy Birthday Mitch, hung above an electric blue neon minibar. The couple was shown holding beer bottles and laughing heartily. The entire set was quite like photos most young couples bring in. There was a sloppy drunken kiss here, someone air guitaring on a table there. I began to complacently press the print button after every six frames. Then I noticed a picture of Mariam's son. Even though I'd never met him, I had seen that face often. It was a face that was branded into the back of my eyes, like the bright red digits of a digital alarm clock in the first few moments of morning consciousness. I was intrigued that these two may also be familiar with the eccentric woman who both frowned upon and adored her family. As I was packing up their photos and ringing up their orders, I decided to make conversation. So, you know Mariam Cliffington? I asked casually. Silence. I glanced upward, and the glance became a fixture. The paleness and shock had matched the exhaustion they both wore in their eyes. Are you okay? I recognized her son in your photos. The girl spoke, tears welling in her eyes. That's our friend Mitch. Those photos were taken a few weeks ago. He passed last week. This order is for his funeral slideshow. Her boyfriend spoke next, clearly unsettled, but retaining his composure, as he quickly recited what I am sure he has gotten used to explaining. He and his daughter were found dead in Mariam's home last Sunday, poisoned. The police have been seeking her for questioning. Have you seen her recently? I was floored. I'm rarely one to lose my cool, but I began tripping over my words like they were raised on a high wire. Yes, I mean, I mean she was in here a few hours ago. She said she was celebrating Gracie's fifth birthday. I, she's working on a new photo album. They were new photos. The girl spoke next. We need to call the police immediately. Gracie's birthday was the Tuesday before they were found. 
They didn't enjoy visits with Mariam, but she insisted on being with them to celebrate. Call them I did. I spent the rest of my shift plus two extra hours conversing with a police detective and the couple. He asked me to print out the information we had on Mariam, and if we had any idea of her whereabouts. They inquired about the frequency of her visits, the types of purchases she made from the rest of the store, her current appearance, and general abnormalities in her behavior. I gave them what they needed, along with surveillance footage from the cameras we'd hidden around the building. They gave me the direct line to their office, and sent me off with my assurance that I would call them immediately if Mariam came into the shop again. The drive home felt relatively non-existent. The thoughts of what had occurred seemed to dominate my sense of time while on the road. Had this lady, who compared me to her own son, been responsible for his death, for the death of his daughter? Would I see her before the police? I arrived at my house in the same psychological state as when I'd left the store. I nearly broke my angle while stumbling over a package that was placed in front of the entryway. I brought it inside into the light and saw that the sender's name was Mom. I wasn't sure what the occasion was, but I assumed it was a late Thanksgiving care package. Regardless, it was good to receive mail from her. I wasn't sure where her new apartment was. Now I had her address, 6312 Prospect Road. Inside the package was a tin box of cookies and a neatly wrapped rectangular gift. I hadn't gotten to eat lunch with all of the police activity, so I immediately started tanking through the cookies as if I'd also skipped my last five meals. After my fourth cookie, I decided to wipe the crumbs from my hands and see what the mystery gift was. I unceremoniously ripped the red and gold metallic paper off of what appeared to be a small photo album bound in black vinyl. I opened it with giddy curiosity and felt the blood empty from my face. It was a timeline of photos from Marion Cliffington's family. These weren't the fun family get-togethers I'd recrafted at the photo lab. I hadn't printed these at all. Page 1 Mitch and Gracie are propped against the arm of a tan leather sofa, a daughter wrapped in father's arms. Their eyes are sunken and rolled backwards, and their tongues are lolled out of their mouths in an unnatural brown colour. There is dried spittle and yellow foam caught in Mitch's black stubble and a mixture of blood and vomit on the front of Gracie's shirt. The blood vessels in their faces are a sickly blue, and their skin is pale and puffy. This photo is labelled, Tuesday, Happy Birthday, Gracie. Page 2 The bodies are placed in a maroon 2013 Toyota RAV4. They've been cleaned up and posed. Mitch in the front seat, Gracie in the center back seat. Their skin has continued to swell as their eyes are puffy slits. Their now purple lips have been sewn shut and side-stitched into makeshift smiles. One of Mitch's arms is placed on the wheel, the other propped against the passenger seat in a pathetic wave. The label, Wednesday taking Gracie to school. Page 3 The bodies are now dressed in swimsuits and are posed around a kiddie pool. Mitch had to be propped up in an unknown manner that is clearly hidden from the frame. He's on his knees at the edge of the pool in blue and white Hawaiian shorts. Gracie is in the pool, positioned on her belly in a striped pink one-piece bathing suit with a matching swim skirt. Their hands are duct taped together and their skin has taken on a sickly yellow color. They are starting to bruise and darken in areas in which they'd evidently been placed for too long. The label, Thursday, 
teaching Gracie to swim. Page 4 Mitch is now dressed in a handsome ivory tuxedo, which has a few off-color stains, where his skin is starting to split open. He's at his kitchen table with a full glass of white wine and a lit dining candle in front of him. The sleeves on his arms reveal dark bruising, where the tape was wrapped with his daughter's arms the day before. Gracie is not in this picture, but Mariam is. She's grasping one of his rotting hands in one of her own, with a brimming glass of red wine in the other. She wears a motherly smile that sickeningly matches the sewn-on smile of her lifeless son. The label, Friday, dinner with the boy. Page 5. Gracie is propped against the wall, the skin of her arms ripped off where the tape was two days prior. Her face is beginning to lose its humanity, but is now coated in makeup worthy of a little Miss Sunshine pageant. Her straw blonde hair is curled and bouncy, and her artificial smile is beginning to tear along the stitching. Next to her is an assortment of porcelain dolls, each made up and dressed with care, that is a bit too sophisticated for a five-year-old girl. To the far left of the frame, Mariam's reflection could be seen in a full body mirror, pointing the camera at the twisted salon she constructed. The label, Saturday, Girls' Night Out. Page 6. There is finally a full frame of the house in which this sickening family montage was photographed. It is a modest one-story home on the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. The paint is a simple white, and it is beginning to flake from a simple picket fence that marked the perimeter. There are no other homes close by that are visible from the angle of the shot. In the left of the frame, the stables of the prized horses Marion mentioned are visible in the background. The gates are wide open, and the horses are nowhere to be seen. Police cars, ambulances, and yellow crime scene tape blocks the rest of the view, except for the mailbox. The address on the mailbox? 6312 Prospect Road. The size of the frame indicate motion blur and plastic paneling. Mariam photographed this from a moving vehicle, likely from far away. The label reads, Sunday, the family gets to see policemen in action on career day. On the final page, Mariam is standing in front of my house, with the package I'd just opened. The label, Thursday. Dropping off goodies for my favorite son. In that moment of realization, weakness took control of my body. Not just from the imagery I was subjected to, but from a sickening feeling that burned in my stomach and intestines. Words from earlier were ripping through my skull. You look just like my son. He and his daughter were found dead in Mariam's home last Friday. Poisoned. I forced myself to scan the backgrounds of those horrible pictures. On the first page, in Gracie's lap, was the cookie tin I had just eaten from. This package was not from my mother. It was from a crazed mother who thought I was her son. Guided to my home from the business card I had given her. Now, here we are. I don't think I have much time left. I'm starting to lose focus. My eyes are in a fervorous affair with the clock, and my focus is none the wiser. Maybe they'll get married and elope. I'll invite this dispatcher to the wedding if I make it through this. I vaguely realize that doesn't make sense, but I don't mind. I'm so tired, 
and now I can't stop coughing. I think I hear sirens in the distance, but I'm not sure if the ambulance has a cure for vomiting blood. Someone is coming up the stairs. I have to go now. Mariam is here, and she wants to give Gracie swimming lessons. So, uh, really don't know what to say here other than I'm pretty sure I'm surrounded by dead people. No, I don't mean that I'm seeing ghosts or zombies or anything like that. I mean that I see them, their faces. Faces of people I know for a fact were dead. Not walking around, perfectly well and alive. Am I the only one that's noticed it? Well, probably, considering I'm not seeing or hearing more people talking about this. Either that, or I'm even deeper into some real shit than I realized. If that's the case, then I'll have to keep this relatively brief. And as soon as I finish writing this, I'll have to get gone quickly. If I had to guess, this might have started with that commercial. It was with this new beauty care product called New Face. Claiming to be able to instantly transform you into a whole new you. You know, standard fare. We can do what doctors and dermatologists can't, Pitch. Well, here's an excerpt from one of their earliest commercials. New face. By putting on a whole new skin. In only seconds, that's right, seconds, you can accomplish what would take plastic surgery hours, even days, to accomplish at less than a fraction of the cost and less than half the pain. You can call and book an appointment with your cosmetologist today to get your brand new face. But hurry, supplies won't last long. Now, the commercial itself, at least back then, was nothing special. It's just some hyperactive yahoo spouting the product's praises while a basic diagram of a person's face was on the screen, changing from before and after use. I personally thought nothing of it. I had no use for it, and I honestly didn't figure many others would either. I figured most would have looked at this and said, <laughs> Interesting. Next. Obviously, though, since I'm here talking about this, that's not what happened. It was a slow rise, sure, but it made it, and eventually I was seeing a bunch of social media threads with the stuff. I remember not being able to open Facebook for a week and a half without seeing at least three or four of my friends posting about, hey, got my new face today, hashtag new year, new me, along with 20-something-odd other random people's posts on it. Again, this was just back when it had come out, about nine or ten months ago now. I should also mention that it only seemed to be available in my city, Pinebrook, North Carolina. I tried at one point, out of sheer curiosity, to look to see just how widespread it was. Nowhere else seemed to offer the product, though. I'm not sure how much longer that's going to stay the case, which, if what I've seen is true, could be a real nightmare for us all. So yeah, it was quite a fad. The way they did it was remarkable. I will say you know, before I found out how they were pulling it off. I remember seeing a lot of speculation on Facebook and such, either asking if anyone knew what the secret was, or just straight up coming up with blown-out-of-the-ass theories, spouting a bunch of scientific jargon nobody, including themselves more than likely, understood. Anyway you sliced it, the results were there. People posting before and after pics were showing how, when they went in for the treatment or operation, they looked vastly different. Some were gaunt and had wrinkles, liver spots, and just generally looked exhausted or sickly. After they got it, though, they come out looking unrecognizable. They'd look younger and healthier, as opposed to the aforementioned elderly, homeless, or drug addict type of look that I'd described before. Soon, of course, I began seeing some of these people out and about on the streets. Some of them were people I kind of knew, people I used to remember seeing frequently out and about either out shopping, grabbing chips and smokes from the 7-Eleven, or lounging around the bus stop just up the street from the Publix. All of them now had a new face. And they looked completely different, like they weren't even the same people anymore. A few of them, a few of the ones I'd occasionally talk to, I'm not a very outgoing person by the way, well I had to ask who the hell they were. 
One time I asked a lady if she'd just blown into town here in the sticks from New York or something, being that hers made her look like a magazine model. Well, she laughed and said, No, you goof, it's me, Christina, from the bar. I looked confused at her. You know, the one you keep getting your Jaeger bombs from every Friday night, which you still have quite the tab racked up for, by the way. Sure enough, she was telling the truth. It was her voice, which I recognized from her sort of country girl accent, but it wasn't her face. Her face used to be kind of rounded, with a dimple showing every time she'd smile. Now her face was a bit more pointed at the chin, longer too. The skin around her face was a bit darker now as well, where it was a very light white color before. Well, it was different, all of it. Not necessarily bad, but definitely different. It was... Oh, oh, uh, sorry, I said, chuckling nervously. Well, I did have a bit of a thing for her, hence the Friday night bar trips. I didn't recognize you. You look different. She chuckled again and told me she'd gotten a new face procedure done. Well, I was painless and didn't need to use no funny gas or nothing. It was over before I knew it, and the best part, I only had to pay $150 for it. She winked and said, So, what do you think? Well, it looks... Uh... I stumbled. I wasn't really sure what to say. Sure, she looked hot with a new look. Though again, I thought she looked cute enough the way she was before. But something about it... How... Uh, I don't know. I guess just how different, how new, I guess you could say it looked on her, caused me to hesitate, freezing my tongue. Her face began to sink a little, noticing my hesitation. I had to think of something to say quickly to keep from hurting her feelings. Finally, I worked up the gumption to say, Well, it looks different. It looks new. Does that mean you like it? She asked shyly. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just so weird seeing you look so different. Not even recognizing you, you know. Her face fell again. Oh, she said, disappointed. Well... Okay, uh, see you Friday? I chuckled just as awkwardly and answered that I wouldn't make it, having to work late that night. Well, it was an obvious lie, but I guess she picked up on the point. And she just said she'd see me around before walking away. This wasn't exactly the only occasion like this, where friends and other people I knew weren't recognizable to me anymore. Though it was the only time shit got embarrassing like that. Well, pretty soon it got to the point where I was basically the only one in town who I knew of that didn't get a new face. I couldn't have cared less for it, don't get me wrong, but I can't lie and say it didn't feel weird being the only one that wasn't walking around with a different looking face. By that point, maybe a month later, commercials were more frequent for it. Now some were even featuring celebrity sponsorships, including famous actors. All of them claimed to have undergone the procedure. In other words, it's very much possible that the way you see some of these people look on TV isn't how they actually looked when they were born, if you get what I mean. And the worst part, I don't think they even know what it actually is they're wearing. I don't think any of them know. Only, of course, the people performing the surgery and, well, now, me. I know this is a lot, and I know they're after me now because of what I know and what I've seen. But others need to know. Others need to know because, like I said, the popularity of this thing is growing more and more. And it scares the hell out of me, what I believe will happen soon if no one shares this. It was last Friday when it started to take a downward dive for me. By then, New Face had been on the scene for almost seven months, with it seeming to only get more and more popular. I'd gotten used to, well, mostly gotten used to, seeing everyone looking completely different from what they had before. Again, I personally felt fine just the way I was, so why change it, even if it was only $150? But at the same time, who was I to judge? Other people want to dump their money into that shit, more power to them. Others, though, I noticed started looking at me weirdly. Some would ask me if I'd gotten one, or when I was going to get one. When I told them my feelings about it, they'd look at me like I was telling them I'd turn down an offer to live in a mansion or something didn't bother me too much, but it was annoying. Because of this, I took to going out less and less during the day, besides work, 
instead deciding I'd just go out at night time. Given how small Pinebrook is, things were usually quiet come nightfall. And add the fact that it got nice and cool when the sun went down, and you had a nice place for a nighttime stroll. That is, until that Friday night when, during my weekly little bar hop I mentioned earlier, my buddy Nestor showed me a thing on his newsfeed about areas of local cemeteries being found exhumed, the bodies missing. No names had been listed as to exactly who the missing deceased were, as it was a sort of this-just-in type deal. No time for any real investigation to have been launched yet. Why do they do it, Don? Nesta asked me, knocking back his fifth shot of Jack that night. Oh, hell if I'd know, I replied, chuckling dryly. Where'd that happen anyway? He looked at the article on his phone for a moment. Hey, hold on, man, look here. He held the phone up to me and pointed out a paragraph he'd highlighted. Ain't that just ways up the road, midway out of Pinebrook? I read the passage, and sure enough, he was right. The article read that, at around 9.45 the night before, the groundskeeper for Morning Gate Cemetery, which, like Nestor said, was just outside of town, reported to police that at least seven plots had been dug up and the bodies were gone. Well, my eyes went wide at this. How the hell? I exclaimed. I know, right? Nestor added. Admittedly, while I was kind of spooked... I was curious more than anything else. Who and just how the hell did somebody dig up and make off with seven bodies without anyone knowing? Of course, the bigger and more frightening question pushed this one to the back of my mind. Why? What was worse, though, was how this happened not too far from the bar, maybe ten or fifteen minutes walking distance. I thought of some creep out there, so close to home, snatching bodies for God only knew what, sent me into goosebumps. It was enough to make me risk my life that night, having Nesta drive me home despite being pretty buzzed, rather than walk home like he usually did. Well, at least I won't run into some creep, I thought. Once I got home, ironically enough, I'd all but forgotten about the article. Everything was just fine. But that was until noon the next day when Nesta sent me another link to a news article. It was a follow-up about another three bodies going missing from Morning Gate, including the groundskeeper himself. What the hell? I know, right? That was last night. What, while we were at the bar? Jesus Christ. Yeah, just before we left. You see what happened to the old buzzard running the place, right? Old man Granger? Yeah, says he's missing too. Missing? More like on the run, I'm almost willing to bet. What do you mean? Come on, think about it. You as well as I do that that place gets locked tighter than a damn high school locker come nightfall, right? Yeah. So? So that plus, unless you're a freaking Spider-Man, good luck scaling the fence around the place. It means that Granger was the only person who'd have access to the grounds at night time. Well, I was stumped there. He had a point. The old man was the only one that could have accessed the grounds and the body. No one else, or at least it was highly unlikely at the time, could have gotten in. Okay, but why? Well, like you said, hell if I'd know. Well, it's not like old Grange was entirely your average Joe, you know. Once again, he had a point. I'd only interacted with the guy a handful of times before. While he wasn't mean or unfriendly, he was a little odd. Of course, he was pushing 68, even if he only looked like he was about 45 or 50. And he spends every night in a freaking graveyard watching over dead people. So can you really be surprised there? Well, that being said, I didn't figure him for the type to actually want to dig them up and steal them. But then, uh, who else? Well, if it was him, though, why'd he report it the other night to the authorities? You mean besides the fact he was cracking? Probably for the attention. Either that or to try and shift the blame, like he is now with his disappearance. Anyhow, it's karaoke night at the bar tonight. You in? I didn't reply. I was barely comfortable leaving my house during daylight. And now this. No, oh, needless to say, that was it for my late night excursions for a while. Especially if Nestor's theory about the old man was true. And again, I couldn't exactly prove him wrong. And he really was out there, hiding somewhere. 
then it was a good bet that that somewhere wasn't far from the cemetery. Well, that above everything else kept me tossing and turning that night, and the night after. I stayed holed up in my house both days straight, only opening the door for the pizza guy. I'd have stayed in Tuesday, too. Hell, I'd have likely never come out from my house again if I could. But unfortunately, body snatching maniac on the loose wasn't quite a good enough excuse for me to miss shifts at work. I guess in that vein, I luckily only worked the morning shifts, meaning I'd be off by no later than four. Despite this, I was still skittish, constantly darting my eyes around everywhere, thinking I'd find him staring back at me. Well, this turned out to be a real pain, as it meant that I couldn't really focus. There were multiple instances where I'd fuck up and forget to give a customer the correct change. Finally, my lunch break rolled around, and I was able to at least get away from the register for a while. Once I'd punched the clock for lunch, I decided to grab a bag of Cheetos, a frosted honey bun, and a Dr. Pepper to munch on. <sighs> Nothing like a little junk food to calm your nerves when you look out for a maniac, right? That was when I looked up and saw him. Right there, right in front of my freaking face on the other side of the shelf, where the chips were, was old man Granger himself. My eyes went wide, color draining from my face. Oh God, he's here. He's right here. What do I do? Every instinct told me to bolt for the phone and dial the police. But I just stood there, frozen. Hey there, Donnie. He exclaimed excitedly in a voice that I was pretty sure wasn't Granger's. We missed you last night at the bar. Yeah, you should have seen me up on the stage singing Sweet Child of Mine. He chuckled before asking how I'd been. Well, I still stood frozen. Now I was more confused than frightened. Keith? Is that you? He just barked an obnoxious laugh. Hell, yeah, last I checked. At least I hope I didn't drink so much that I forgot who the hell I was. I continued staring stupidly at him. Ah, that's Keith, all right. Why does he look like old man Granger? How? What's wrong? Is he a ghost or something? He asked. Oh, uh, no, I just... Uh, I didn't know what I was supposed to say. I didn't know it was you there. I thought it was, well, someone else. He cocked his eyebrow at me. Well, I don't know how. Last I checked, there's only one me. Yeah, but you... You look different. I didn't recognize you. You get a new face? He barked out another laugh and said, Oh, yeah, that. Yeah, I got this done last Wednesday. Connie was getting one, which, by the way, made her look better than she did back when she was 18. And she told me I should get one, too. Shit. Couldn't beat the results or the price, even with a lifetime supply of Botox. Ah, I see. I replied, anxiety flooding through my body. He told me that the one he got was a fresh sample. For some reason, this alarmed me. What? What does that mean? Well, from what the docs say, it's a fresh new one they sent in just the night before. Oh, my legs started shaking. Brand new. Just sent in, but then... Oh, and um... Exactly when did you say you got this done? I asked. The horrifying feeling was quickly worming its way up from my stomach, causing me to feel nauseous. Uh, a couple of days ago, Saturday, I believe. He stroked his chin, the chin of old man Granger, and added, I remember because I was excited to show up sporting the new look to the mic that night. Well, that did it. I quickly booked it to the bathroom where I promptly emptied my stomach. By the time I was done, I was left feeling dizzy. Not only that, but now I was more scared than ever. Now I knew it wasn't Granger who was snatching the bodies from the cemetery. And that instilled an all-new fear into me. Now I didn't know who or what to expect. Then another thought occurred to me. Keith didn't even know that was old man Granger's face he was now wearing. That got me thinking about everyone else in town I saw, walking around with a new face. Was it the same for them? After just barely managing to finish my shift that day, I bolted home quicker than I ever had before, looking over my shoulder the entire time, and locked myself in the house. Once I was at least relatively certain no one was following me, or able to break in if they were, I started looking again at the news link Nestor had sent me. 
As far as the case of the missing bodies from Morningate Cemetery went, the police were still investigating, and still at a loss. I then decided, against all better judgment, to look into my haunting little hunch a little further. I started looking to see if any of the cemeteries close by had any sort of incidents. After about five minutes of searching, I found nothing for any graveyards closer to town than Morning Gate. I should have stopped there, I know, and God knows I wish I had. How? I'd have been perfectly freaking fine never being the wiser about any of this. But as it happened, I did dig further. I started looking for incidents in cemeteries farther than Morning Gate. Took a bit of time, but I eventually found it. It's a small string of headlines from another town's news site that was listed as a series of posts on a tabloid website. It was titled, Terror of the Dallas NC Body Snatchers, and it detailed a string of incidents where bodies in the cemeteries were found missing. Photos were posted of graves that were left uncovered or sloppily recovered. The post stated that police investigated the cases for almost a year, even apprehending a few suspects. But each of them had airtight alibis that cleared them, and with no other leads, as well as little to basically no kind of concrete evidence to anyone else, they eventually had to pack it up and declare the cases cold. Man, as you can imagine, no trace or leads were ever seen or heard about the missing bodies since. I felt sick to my stomach. Looking at the date of the last article, I realised that it was only about a year and a half before the ads for New Face started cropping up here in town. I couldn't believe it. But there it was, clear as goddamn crystal. This product is made out of dead bodies. That was when an all-new wave of terror shook through me. Thinking again of what Keith said in the convenience store, I realised that whoever these sick, twisted fuckheads were, they weren't picky about how long the specimen had actually been dead before using it. Granger wasn't dead until they got to him. In other words, these people weren't limited to grave robbing for this. They were apparently killers as well. And that's why I have to leave. I spent the past few nights packing what I can and finding somewhere I can stay in the next town over. I put in my two weeks notice at the convenience store as well, even though, once I'm done with this, I'm going to be well on my way out of Pinebrook and not looking back. I'll just leave you with this. I don't know how much longer it'll be before a new face or possibly some other fucked up byproduct made by whoever these psychos are ends up expanding their market outside of Pinebrook. But it will. I just hope that when it does, I'll be far away and people will know. Also, I hope that no one sees my face again. I'm afraid there'll be a chance that when they find me, it might not actually be me wearing it. My father was always the most caring of men. I know many of my friends had had problems with their fathers at some point. Some were prone to drink, and others were quick to anger. My father did neither of these things. He had no problems expressing his love for my mother and me. He was a jovial, gregarious man who loved life and loved those around him. He had the occasional beer or mixed drink from time to time, but never in excess. He was a very restrained and moderate man. In fact, I can only remember one time he yelled at me unfairly. I was young, ten years old or so. I was playing with my friend Benjamin in the backyard. We lived in rural Simsbury, Connecticut. The town was surrounded by mountains and deciduous forests. We were talking about <laughs> which monster would win in a fight. The tomatoes from Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, or the clowns from Killer Clowns from Outer Space. The conversation quickly burned out when I told my friend in a matter-of-fact tone that <laughs> neither existed, so it didn't really matter. It was then that my friend turned to me and said, Fake monsters aren't that scary. Now, real monsters, they scare the bejesus out of me. I was worried that he was about to tell me a bunch of hogwash and try to scare me, but my curiosity overcame me. 
I had to hear more about this real monster. I paused for a moment before asking him cautiously. Real monsters? What are you talking about? Benjamin said, Don't you know anything, man? Haven't you heard of the Creeping Fiend? I answered in the negative when he told me the story of the Creeping Horror. My friend began, They say that there's something around these parts, that there's a creature living in the woods. My dad told me he saw it once, reach down from the trees and snare a full-grown deer and pull it up into the tree and rip it apart with his bare hands. And my father would never lie to me. I asked Benjamin, What does it look like? It looks like a man, but he's super skinny, like he's never eaten. He has an old gas mask on and he wheezes heavily. I've been told he's a soldier that came back from World War II that had his lungs rotted by nerve gas. I heard that a flamethrower mounted the mask to his face, and he can only feed by reducing his prey to a puddle and sucking up the fluids. He was unable to live amongst people, so they banished him out into the woods. Benjamin continued. His name comes from the fact that he skulks around the woods and no one knows he's there until you hear him wheezing right behind you. But by then, it's too late. If you hear him, don't turn around, because he will get you. Your best bet is to run for your life. They say he comes out to anyone who calls his name. If you shout out his name five times, he'll appear behind you. I was a little scared, but... <laughs> I knew that Benjamin was probably lying to me. I told Ben, Yeah, you're full of it. There's no such thing as the creeping fiend. He quickly retorted, If I'm a liar, why don't we try calling him, you big chicken? <sighs> I was so angry at being called a coward that I momentarily lost my better judgment. I don't like to be scared, and there was a likely possibility that I would easily spook myself and send my heart racing. I called my friend out. If I'm going to call him, then you're going to call him with me. Benjamin reluctantly agreed, and we set about calling the creeping horror. Unbeknownst to me, this would set off an irreversible chain of events. Benjamin and I stood facing each other, just in case he would appear behind one of us. <laughs> we started out in a barely audible whisper. Creeping horror. We paused in uncertainty before continuing a little louder. Creeping horror. My heart was thumping around in my chest. Creeping horror. We practically shouted now. Maybe it was us <laughs> doing the calling together, but I felt braver. We shouted now. Creeping horror! I sucked in a deep breath to roar his name one last time. But something stopped me dead in my tracks. The door to my house burst open and my father flew out into the yard with a look akin to horror mixed with another indiscernible emotion on his face. I wouldn't understand that look for many years, and when I would finally comprehend it, I would tell myself that I would give anything not to recognize it. He roared. Stop! Benjamin broke into a dead sprint, fearing the tone in my father's voice essentially leaving my ass hanging out to dry. My father gripped me by both arms so hard that I thought my bones would break. He looked me directly in the eyes and said, Never say those words again. Do you understand? Don't. 
I never saw my father so worked up in my entire life. At first I thought he was mad at me for shouting. Was he angry at me for playing with Benjamin, who my mother had called a bad influence? <laughs> that was true. A few years later he would fall in with the wrong crowd and vanish off the face of the earth completely. Later it dawned on me what had incurred that fearful look in my father. He was terrified. He was horrified of the creeping horror. He knew something I didn't. Had he seen the thing with his own eyes? I decided that I needed to get to the bottom of this. I couldn't ask my dad, so I waited a couple of days when I was alone with Mom to ask if she knew anything about the creeping horror. She looked at me quizzically before responding. <sighs> it's just old folklore around here. It's just a story the parents told to their kids when they were younger to keep them from running off. I asked, Did Grandpa ever tell Dad the story of the creeping horror? She thought for a moment and said, You know, I don't think he ever mentioned it, but probably. I could ask him if you want. I answered in the negative. I had to do some more sleuthing on my own. I lost interest for a few years. I was a kid, after all, <laughs> and got easily distracted. Five years would pass before my interest was renewed. I was a teenager then and was constantly in competition with my friends. We always had to prove who was the strongest, the smartest, the bravest. A few of them liked to boast that they had actually gone into the woods and, at the top of their lungs, called forth the creeping horror. Some embellished the story by saying they saw him and escaped, while one or two said they'd actually kicked his ass. They were quickly singled out as liars. All this talk brought about a resurgence of interest in the creeping horror. I began tracking the stories back to their roots. I asked my friends where they heard the tale. Most had heard it from their parents, who had heard it from their grandparents, who in turn had heard it from their great-grandparents. I caught a lucky break one day when I was talking to my friend's grandfather. He told me, Why don't you ask your pa about all this? He's got his own story. If the tales are true, he lost two of his friends when he was out playing with them. He cut himself off and said, ah, Old age must have made me a gossip. <laughs> Ask your father if you want the story. I tried to press the topic, but he would only respond, Ask your father. I knew I couldn't ask my father that, so I decided to do a little research at the local library. I didn't know the kids' names or even what happened to them. I went to the library and asked the ancient librarian if she had any local papers from the 60s and 70s. She looked at me like I was a huge time sink in her otherwise busy life of sitting behind a desk reading a harlequin novel. I held my ground and insisted that I be allowed to view the records. She huffed and took me back to where the microfiche was stored. Now, a little side note. Research using microfiche is no way fun or intriguing. I wholeheartedly agree with movies opting to montage it, have someone stumble across relevant information within minutes. It took a week of going to the library after school, asking the same stuffy librarian for permission to use the microfiche, who, by the end, disliked me so much that her hatred was palpable. And then, tirelessly looking through it for hours, before I found something. I expected to come across a headline like, Two Youth Mysteriously Vanish. But what I found instead was much more grisly. Two local teenagers' bodies 
found in the woods. I read and reread the article until I was confident that this was what my friend's grandfather was talking about. The article in the newspaper discussed the discovery of two bodies in the woods. The bodies were badly decomposed and looked like they'd been torn apart by scavengers. They were only able to identify the bodies by linking the parents' missing person report with the discovery of the corpses. The two missing teenagers were named Alan and Justine. No leads had been discovered, but the police were hopeful. The kids were the same age as my dad and had attended the same school. I exclaimed, It has to be the creeping horror. He did this. All of a sudden, I didn't feel so alone in the back room of the library. It was as if the mere mention of his name was enough to call him to me. I quickly left the library, but the sensation of eyes watching me didn't leave until I arrived home. I wanted to talk to my dad, but I was afraid of what might happen. I didn't know which was a worse outcome. He might lose it and scream at me. Or, he might just tell me everything. I quietly ate dinner and went up to bed. I had trouble sleeping that night. Just as I was nearing the border between sleep and the waking world, I would hear something that would snap me awake. I would hear a rasping breath that seemed to be only inches away from me. I decided that I had to confront my dad, or find out what was making that rasping sound. My confrontation with my father went poorly. The minute I mentioned his friends, his face contorted into a look of pure anguish and fear, and he stepped so close to me that I was fearful that he would smash my toes with his feet. He grabbed the collar of my shirt and pulled me close while saying in a tone that could not be disobeyed, This is not a fun little mystery to unravel. People have died, goddammit. I don't want to hear this type of talk ever again. Do you understand me? I left the investigation into the creeping horror alone. My father refused to talk and I realized that the only way I could get the full story of his encounter with the fiend was through him. Since the other two had died, I had to let sleeping dogs lie. For a couple of nights, I heard the sound of heavy breathing just as I was about to fall asleep. But that eventually subsided. Time continued to pass. I graduated high school and went to an out-of-state college. The next time I would hear of the creeping horror would be from my father's lips as he lay on his deathbed. It was late during my senior year in college that I received a panic call from my mother. My father had been in hospice care for the past few months. He had pancreatic cancer and people who are familiar with oncology know that the Manifestation has an 80 to 90% mortality rate, depending on when it was discovered. My father dealt with ulcers all his adult life, or what he thought were ulcers. The cancer crept and metastasized through him until there was little to do but wait for the end. I drove home as quick as I could and found my mother had basically entered a catatonic state after calling me. My father was in bed and creeping towards the end. My father asked me to give him a little injection of Demerol to help with the pain. I could see from his gaunt body and glassy stare that he was on death's door. I gave him the Demerol. It took effect almost instantaneously and he relaxed noticeably. He told me that he didn't have much longer on this earth, and he had something he needed to confess. It was now that he told me about the creeping horror, 
and the death of his two friends, Alan and Justine. He began. When I was in junior year in high school, I had two close friends. I'd known Alan all my life and had met Justine freshman year. For two long years, <laughs> I carried a candle for Justine ever since I saw her. Your mother would enter my life much later in college. Justine was homeschooled until the first year of high school. She and Alan were close friends. They actually lived next to one another. And when I learned this, I was constantly pressuring Alan to set us up. He was hesitant and I sometimes wondered if maybe he carried the same feelings for Justine. But he eventually relented and set about giving me an opportunity to talk to her. He gave a series of wet coughs before continuing. One day, Alan invited Justine and I to hang out. We went to his house and packed a lunch while shooting the shit. We eventually decided to have a picnic out in the woods and go exploring. <laughs> we all knew of the creeping horror myth, but none of us really believed in it. I was ecstatic to have this opportunity to make my feelings for Justine known. We really didn't know each other socially, so the only opportunity I had was through the medium of Alan. He played the role perfectly and introduced us and then we ventured out into the woods to explore. He continued. We quickly tired of exploring and settled down for lunch in the bag I'd been carrying. I carved up some bread and cheese and we ate while making small talk in a small idyllic clearing. I kept glancing over at Justine. I couldn't help it. Looking at her, I just took my breath away. I had a serious case of puppy love. When we'd finished with lunch, Alan suggested that we have some fun and try and call the creeping horror. Justine was, at first, opposed to the idea, but she quickly relented when I agreed. I desperately wanted to prove myself to Justine, and this seemed like a viable way. We all faced each other and began to call him. We needed only to shout his name five times. We began, creeping horror. My eyes were focused on Justine, and a smile played across her face. Creeping horror. I knew that I was madly in love with this girl. Creeping horror. Her face had dissolved into uncertainty. Creeping horror. Her face was sheer terror now. She broke away from us screaming. She had apparently heard some heavy breathing. She ran off and Alan gave me that commiserating glance that I should be the one to uh, comfort her. I pursued her through the woods and found her a little while later. She was close to breaking down in tears and was insistent that she heard the breathing right behind him. I soothed her with comforting words and when she'd calmed down, I made my feelings known. I told her that I wanted to go study with her. She accepted my feelings and agreed to go on a date. Before returning to Alan, I planted a kiss on her. My first kiss, and it took my breath away. We returned to Alan and were getting ready to return home when he made the challenge. He wanted to complete the summons. My father paused for a second, and I wondered if he was going to continue on with the story. He decided in the affirmative, and proceeded. I had no desire for tomfoolery, but Alan was insistent. Justine was terrified. I realized he wasn't going to back down, and consented. But I stipulated that we call the creeping horror as far away from Justine as possible. 
I didn't believe in superstitions, but I didn't want to scare her any further. Justine agreed to wait in the clearing while me and Alan proceeded further into the woods for this fool's errand. We decided that it would be better to call the creeping horror on our own, far away from each other. So we walked in opposite directions until we could barely hear the other. I wanted to be far enough away from Justine that, should something spook me, I wouldn't embarrass her by crying out like a child. He asked if I was ready, and I answered yes. Shh, I swear to God that I would give anything never to have agreed to tempt fate like that. But that ship has already sailed. We began calling his name. forest was deadly quiet. Our second invocation, creeping horror, sent our echoes rebounding through the trees. I heard a twig snap in the distance. I figured it was the wildlife in the area being startled by our shouts. I shouted a third time, There was a rustle close by in the underbrush. Whatever it was, it was getting closer to me. I called again. Creeping horror. I could have sworn that I smelled sulfur. Were we on hunting grounds? Was I smelling gunpowder? I sucked in another breath and gathered myself before shouting one final time. Creeping horror. I literally roared it the last time and had to take a few seconds to catch my breath. When I did, I realized that I wasn't the only one breathing heavily. It was almost negligible at first, but it slowly grew. Before I knew it, the sound was a few yards behind me. It was a sound of breathing. It was deep and sounded like it was coming through some sort of breathing apparatus. I spent a few seconds thinking that it was my overactive imagination, but the sound grew louder and closer. I knew that if I turned round, it would attack me. I knew that this was the creeping horror. The sound of labored breathing grew closer until it was just a few feet behind me. I willed everything in my body to run, but I was paralyzed where I stood. Fear and panic washed over me like a tidal wave. I knew that if I tried to run, the fiend would be on me in a second. It was so close that I could hear the dry rattle in its lungs as it huffed and puffed behind me. I knew my only option was to fight. I brought my pocket knife for the bread and cheese for lunch. I slowly slid my hand towards my pocket. The sound of breathing was just inches away now. My fingers glanced the pocket knife, then I pulled it up into my hand. I could now feel the breaths heating the back of my neck. I tightened every muscle in my body to prevent pissing myself and voiding my bowels. I had to act quickly or be consigned to death by the creeping horror. I didn't want to be reduced to nothing but a spatter on the bed of the woods when I had so much life left to live. I was in the grasp of the creeping horror now. It rasped in a low, gravelly voice that went right into my ear. I'm so hungry. I wanted to run. I wanted to plead. I wanted to be back at home. I thought that I was going to die out there in the woods. He asked for another shot of Demerol, 
and I relented. I felt the thing's hot breath on me, and I knew that I was at his mercy. He leaned in close to my other ear and said, Your flesh will be mine. That was all it took. I whirled around and stabbed behind me. The blade pierced flesh and caught on something. The creature stumbled backwards and, as the adrenaline drained away from me, I realized what I had done. Justine laid on a bed of leaves, gurgling wetly. My blade had pierced her throat, just below the jawline. She writhed in a panic and clutched at the bloody knife. Before I could get to her, she pulled out the blade, and blood flowed from the wound. My father paused to compose himself before continuing. I knelt by her and put pressure on the wound, but it was too deep. It was so bloody. I told her I loved her. She just gurgled in shock. She died shortly after. I wept for a few seconds before I heard Alan exclaim, Jesus Christ, what happened? The pieces slid into place. <laughs> She'd wanted to scare me. She crept up behind me, breathing heavily like the creeping horror legend. <sighs> She'd only wanted to play a joke on me. Alan knelt at the body and pressed a hand into the ragged wound and took her pulse with the other hand. He paused a few seconds as if time would prove him wrong. It didn't. He turned back towards me and was in the process of telling me, She's dead. We have to call the police. When I stabbed him in the chest. He tried to stumble back and crawl away, but I was on him with my pocket knife. I raised the blade several times and brought it down into his body. The third stab slipped between the ribs and pierced the heart. I had panicked, and in my fear of being caught in a prank on Ori, I had killed my best friend and my girlfriend. I listened to his tale in shock. He told me how he'd left the bodies where they lied. He told me of the months spent in anticipation of being revealed by the police. That time never came. He said it all with a sense of quasi-relief and shame. He spoke of the guilt that had grown in him, which was compounded by my inquiries into the creeping fiend. The very thought of that memory sent wounds deep into his soul. It was only now that he was able to confess to his crimes, because he was so close to death's door. My father, the benevolent and loving man, had the weight of two souls on his mind. He'd spent thirty years with that secret, and no one to tell it to. It had eaten away at his conscience for thirty fucking years, and when he finally told someone, I doubt it eased the pain of it at all. He wanted to cleanse his conscience, but was afraid of the consequences. It was then that I learned my father was a coward. He couldn't face the consequence and bring consolation to the two families of his friends. He fled from the truth, and with time, the crime eventually became unsolved. The man I saw as my hero, my role model was nothing more than a coward. He asked for another shot of Demerol. I gave it to him. I plunged the syringe into the small rubber stop bottle and withdrew the entire solution. My father watched me with bright and delirious eyes. I leaned in close to him 
and whispered, I love you. He mumbled something about Justine, but he was slipping further each second. I'd already given him so much Demerol, just a little bit more was all that was needed. I pierced his arm with a needle and injected the entire solution into him. My memory of him was looking into his face. His face was eerily similar to the emotions he showed me that one day, so long ago, when I tried to call the creeping horror with my friend Benjamin. The emotions expressed in his face were that of unbridled fear and uncontrollable guilt. He died looking that way. I'm telling you this now because I know that he is dead. I killed him. He slipped away peacefully after an overdose of Demerol. I know that the families of Alan and Justine deserve some sort of respite. They deserve justice. But that time is gone. Finally, their killer can be revealed. At the end of it all, I am ambivalent. There are two conflicting emotions. My childhood admiration and respect that I have for my father and the horror of that terrible secret he bore for over 30 years. He was my idol, and he was also a fiend capable of unspeakable horrors. I won't conclude this story by saying there never was a monster, because that's not true. The monster wasn't something as simple as flesh and blood, nails and fangs. The monster isn't isolated in the small town of Simsbury, Connecticut. It is everywhere. It was, and is, a part of us. The creeping horror was my father the day he accidentally murdered his girlfriend and stabbed his best friend to death to protect himself. The creeping horror was me that night when I gave him that fatal overdose. In some horrible way, the creeping horror is inside all of us. It is in who we are and what we can become, given circumstances that are entirely out of our control. Of course, the big question is, is there anyone still with me? Have you all fallen asleep to the crackling sounds of the campfire in my deep voice? <laughs> um, well, yeah, probably not having any of the mid-roll adverts definitely helped that one, didn't it? Are you still with me? Anybody? Hello? Tell me you're still here. What well, kind of me hopes a lot of you aren't, or you've drifted off to sleep, so I'm going to keep this end nice and mellow just like the rest of it. Hello? <laughs> okay, I'm just messing with you now. So yeah, um, wasn't exactly what I had planned for this Sunday evening, but uh, things turn out the way they do. So I um, hope that was okay for you all. Four stories around the crackling campfire for a Sunday evening. And of course, I will be back, definitely back tomorrow night with an hour plus story, something brand new for you all. And meet those kisses will definitely finish next weekend. Sorry, um, unavoidable things happened. And it just wasn't happening this Sunday. So, hope that was okay. Had these stories lined up for a rainy day. Or a campfirey day. Well, till next week, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well... If you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams.
Bye-bye.